At some point, Antichrist will declare that he is himself God and will be worshipped as such in the temple. Let's see what St. Paul says in the Bible, talking about the Antichrist coming before the second coming of Christ. Hey, my friends, did you see the show I did recently where I touched on the Catholic conception of the Antichrist and how it relates to the rebuilding of the Jerusalem temple and the special cow called a red heifer? Well, in this show, we're going to start a deep, deep dive into how all these matters are linked and why. Who or what is Antichrist? Wasn't that Hitler or Stalin or is it AI or something yet to come? This show is part of a series based on the research and writing of Dr. Micah Hickson and Paul Cahill, which you will find exclusively at LifeSiteNews.com. Stick around. You're not going to want to miss this one. We are about to come upon May 9th in very short order. you got to get yourself out to Ottawa to the National March for Life, which is taking place on May the 9th. Make sure you're there. Aren't you sick? of Trudeau, the most abortion-pushing prime minister we've ever had. It's time. It's time to show the politicians in Ottawa we're not going to take it anymore. We're there to show that we are for life. And these are not the Canadian values he always says they are. No, the Canadian values are to stand for life from sea to shining sea. This is still a Christian nation. Let's show them that. We'll see you at the March for Life on May 9th. God bless you. Let's begin as we always do, with the sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Antichrist. What a sensationalist topic. Over the years, in fact, over the centuries, so much ink has been spilled writing about Antichrist. Movies have been made about him, some of which have been really terrifying. Rivals have claimed that their rivals have been the Antichrist. For instance, during the Protestant Reformation, many of the most important names tried to claim that the papacy itself was the Antichrist prophesied in Holy Scripture. But today, we're going to look at some exclusive theological research LifeSite News has published, cut through the media sensationalism, and see what we can know for sure about this terrifying figure of evil. First things first, while there have been many foreshadowings in both historical figures and systems, the Antichrist will be a single man, a single human person. He'll be a mere man, that is, he won't be Satan incarnate like our Lord was God incarnate. But nonetheless, he will have amazing charism and powers of seduction and deception such that he will draw almost the whole world to himself. Many authors say, based on scripture, that he will start his career in a lowly and obscure way, but because of his personal powers and diabolical assistance, he will rocket to a position of great power and influence, even unto worldwide rule. In the Apocalypse, or Revelations, the last book of the Bible, St. John writes concerning Antichrist, and I quote, Power was given him over every tribe and people and tongue and nation, end quote. He will also perform amazing feats, which many will take to be miracles. Over time, the Antichrist will declare that he is the true Christ or Messiah, and according to the fathers and doctors of the church, he will sadly deceive the Jewish people into believing this claim and accepting him as their long-awaited Messiah. Many of the fathers teach this sad fact, such as St. Jerome, St. Gregory the Great, St. Ambrose, and others, based on the words of our Lord himself in the scriptures. Jesus said, I am come in the name of my Father, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. And that's from the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 42. This is also the view held by mystics such as Bartholomew Holzhauser and Mary of Greta, who wrote the great works, The City of God. This mystic, Mary of Greta, is said to have talked about a difficult period for the Jewish people, she saw the future, of course, who will, in the end, approach the Antichrist for help, and presumably at that time the Antichrist will be seen simply as a great statesman or some kind of leading politician or whatever. But Mary of Greta writes this, and I quote, He will now declare himself ready to fulfill their wishes, talking the Jewish people's wishes, right? While at the same time, he will arouse the neighboring nations to revolution. 
the Jews will finally bring him a costly crown and a kingly garment, as well as a scepter, and declare him as their freely elected king. End quote. But as I've said, this isn't just based on the words of one or two mystics. It's what the fathers and doctors of the, and the great theologians of the church thought was going to happen. So we're on safe ground thinking that the Jewish people will be deceived into accepting the Antichrist as their Moshiach. Moshiach, that's the Hebrew word for Messiah. And it's a handy way to mark when we're talking about the idea of the earthly Messiah and thinking about these matters from their perspective. The Antichrist will probably himself be of Jewish origin. Some say that he will be of the tribe of Dan, but others disagree, and it's an open question. However, once he is acclaimed, he will quickly use his worldwide power to persecute the church of our Lord Jesus Christ and wage war on God. Most authors think that he will begin with a deceptive show of kindness and greatness, but even then he will be persecuting the church and denying the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ and moving towards setting himself in the place of Jesus Christ. At some point, Antichrist will declare that he is himself God and will be worshipped as such in the temple. Let's see what St. Paul says in the Bible, talking about the Antichrist coming before the second coming of Christ. You'll read this in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4, and I quote, Let no man deceive you by any means, for unless there come a revolt first and the man of sin, that's the Antichrist, man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and is lifted up above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits in the temple of God, showing himself as if he were God. So there it is, the temple. So as I mentioned before, there isn't a consensus on where this temple will be. Some authorities say that the temple in which the Antichrist will sit will be either the church or perhaps a church, a significant one, maybe like St. Peter's Basilica in Rome or elsewhere. Some think that he will reign from Rome itself, although it seems more common to think that Rome will be the seat of something called the false prophet during a vacancy in the Holy See. And that's what some 20th century theologians said before Vatican II. Others, in fact most, it seems, say that the temple refers to a literal temple in Jerusalem, which Antichrist will rebuild after it was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans. Before we go on, I want to do just a really quick detour on that because there's a really amazing story. In the fourth century, Julian the Apostate was an emperor of Rome. He actually knew two saints, Gregory of Nuncianzus and Basil the Great. When he became emperor, he unveiled his true views and tried to take Rome back to paganism. He struck up an odd alliance with some Jewish groups and tried to rebuild the Jerusalem temple as a means of disproving Christ's prophecy that the temple would be destroyed. And that did not go very well. A Roman historian who was himself a soldier under Julian tells us the following, and I quote, The undertaking was frustrated in a miraculous manner. The place was made inaccessible by fearful balls of fire that broke out near the foundations and so scorched and burned the workmen that they were forced to retire. The frequent attacks finally caused the work to be abandoned, end quote. The miraculous events which prevented Julian's rebuilding of the temple have been understood as vindicating Christ's prophecy. Some take it as an indication that will, it, the temple will never be rebuilt. Others, however, say that it is possible that the rebuilding of the temple was simply not to happen at that time. Rebuilding this temple in Jerusalem is held to be a key means by which the Antichrist will deceive the Jewish people into accepting him as Moshiach. That's the opinion of some very big names, Saints Arrhenius, Saint Hippolytus, Saint Cyril of Jerusalem, Saint Damascene, and others. It's a pretty reasonable thing to think from the Jewish perspective, rebuilding the temple and reestablishing the sacrifice is one of their central conditions for recognizing that their earthly Moshiach has come. In fact, it's the definitive confirmation that he has come, according to the enormously influential 12th century Jewish sage Maimonides. He writes about a possible Moshiach this way. He says, and I quote, If he succeeds in the above, 
builds the temple in its place and gathers the dispersed of Israel, he is definitely the Moshiach, end quote. Not all the fathers and doctors of the church agree that the Antichrist actually needs to succeed in doing this, that is, rebuilding the temple. You can see that, for example, in St. Robert Bellarmine, the doctor of the church, who says that of the Antichrist that he will attempt to restore the temple and that he would not be accepted by the Jews if he did not, quote, in some way restore the temple, end quote. So there is a reason that the temple was destroyed in 70 AD and why Christ went out of his way to prophesy this event. We're used to a world in which the Jewish religion exists without the temple, but at the time of Christ, it was completely central to the Jewish religion. When it was destroyed, all of the different temple mitzvot, it's called, that means the commandments or good deeds, became impossible because they were all predicated on having a temple and temple sacrifice. This was such a radical change, the ending of the temple sacrifice, that even Jewish authors say that this destruction led to the birth of a new religion, focused on the law and learning rather than the temple and sacrifice. And that religion is commonly called rabbinic Judaism. These aren't my words, by the way. They're the words of Alieza Salzberg and MyJewishLearning.com, and many history books will tell you the same thing. The destruction of the temple in 70 AD marked the conclusion of what had started with the tearing of the veil in the temple at Christ's death. That tearing of the temple veil was divine proof that the promises of the Old Covenant had been fulfilled. It was the time for what God promised to Jeremiah a new covenant. St. Thomas Aquinas says that when Christ died, the rites of the old law also died, in that they could still be observed, but they were no longer effective or obligatory. But at a certain point, once the gospel had been spread sufficiently, these rites became deadly too, and that they couldn't be observed without mortal sin. This is because what these rites pointed to, Christ and redemption, had actually already come. Their continued observation was basically a denial that everything had been fulfilled by Christ. That's why, by the way, some warn that the Christian Seder meals at Passover are problematic. And I know that everyone who does this has good intentions, but it would probably have horrified St. Thomas Aquinas and other great lights of the church. It's also why Christians should not be getting involved in the restoring of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. A few weeks ago, we looked at Byron Stinson, the self-proclaimed Judeo-Christian who had raised some red heifers and taken them out to Israel in preparation for the building of the temple. Again, Stinson obviously has good intentions too, but this attempt to resurrect Jewish rites was always understood as a denial that Christ had already come in the flesh and fulfilled the law. And that's precisely how St. John describes the Antichrist. And I quote, For many seducers are gone out into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a seducer and an Antichrist. End quote. And that's from 2 John 1.7. And then there's huge geopolitical problems. Imagine they're trying to rebuild the Jerusalem temple. Well, currently, on Temple Mount, there stands the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the third holiest site in Islam. It's simply impossible to rebuild the Jewish temple without destroying the mosque, and the Islamic world is not going to tolerate such destruction without further violence. But it's important to remember that some of the Jewish authorities think that Moshiach's reign will commence with a great war between two powers symbolically called Gog and Magog. And this talk of bloodshed actually leads us to the fact that the Antichrist will bring about the cruelest, most brutal, most thorough, and most horrible persecution in the history of the church, or indeed the history of the world. But what exactly is going to happen? Well, in the later stages of Antichrist, it will be a direct and bloody persecution. We can get an eye for what it'll be like in the Gospels and in the events that served as foreshadowings of this time to come. For example, the persecution of the Jews leading up to the Maccabean Revolt, the persecution of Catholics by the pagan Roman Empire, the Aryans, the Protestant Reformation, Nazi Germany, and Communist Russia. 
Theologians and mystics say that the Antichrist persecution will surpass and combine these terrible times. St. Robert Bellarmine says that there will be four broad stages of Antichrist. Number one, the Antichrist will start by prohibiting Christian institutions and imposing Jewish laws and rights. Number two, he will proclaim himself as the Moshiach and deceive the Jews who will help him establish himself further. Number three, he will then proclaim himself to be God and demand worship from all when he is sitting in the temple, wherever that temple will be. And number four, he will finally end by cursing all other gods and religions, including the true God and true religion, as well as the sects which helped him to get to power. He'll abandon any pretense of being the Jewish Moshiach and persecute the Jews too. Everyone will be required to worship him as God, and those who don't will be destroyed horribly. The good news, well, if you can call it good news, is that this terrible reign will be temporary. It will be short. Uh, although, in fact, for those who live through it, it'll seem like an eternity, I'm sure. But based on both the book of Daniel and the book of the Apocalypse in the Bible, most Catholic authorities think that will last about three and a half years or 1,260 days, as you'll read in the Bible. At that point, our Lord will destroy him. St. Paul says that the Lord Jesus shall kill him with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy him with the brightness of his coming. There's a lot that could be said on that, but I don't want to focus on how terrible that persecution will be, though it will be terrible. Instead, I want to talk about how it will be at the beginning, before any of the bloody persecution starts, and in fact, before even softer form of that persecution starts. The world has to be ready for Antichrist to come. The world has to have fallen away from God and from the true religion. Our Lord taught that both faith and charity to, would decay toward the end of the world. That's what many call the great apostasy. This decay of faith and charity will be, according to many writers, through the spread of naturalism. The idea that mankind can set aside the truths of divine revelation and the Holy Trinity and the Incarnation and the Redemption. It's the idea that we can live and exist without regard for the objective supernatural order established and willed by God. If we aren't living in that time right now, I'd hate to see what the real great apostasy will be like. But when the Antichrist first comes, many writers believe that he will begin with a show of benevolence and reasonableness in his denial of Christianity and imposition of his own religion. One writer says that, quote, he will hide behind a mask of moderation and feigned holiness, end quote. How will that be? Well, it might start to make sense if we think of his early stages as continuing the humanism and secularism of our time today. That certainly is how Monsignor Robert Hugh Benson depicts it in his famous novel, Lord of the World. The Jewish convert priest, Father Lehman, says that there will be two key measures in his persecution. One, the banning of Christian teaching, and two, the obligation to teach error. And we can already see this drift and trend. We can see it in England with the banning of silent prayer outside an abortion clinic and with the various attempts to treat Holy Scripture as hate speech around the world. We can also see it in the obligation to allow statues of Satan in government buildings on the grounds of religious freedom. But in fact, the attempt to get Christianity out of the public square, to uncrown Christ, and to remove him from his throne over our society has been going on for a very long time. And here again, we're going to see an alignment between what Catholic theologians think will be the religion of Antichrist and what significant Jewish authorities expect will be the religion for the Gentiles under the Moshiach. In the next part of this series of videos, we're going to do another deep dive into this religion for the Gentiles. And it isn't Christianity, at least Christianity as we know it, nor is it compatible with true Christianity. You're going to be shocked at how advanced this religion for the Gentiles already is in the world today, and the really significant world leaders who are pushing this religion for the Gentiles. If you want to learn more 
about these topics, take a look at the two links in the description below, which are part of an ongoing series of articles on this topic. They go into a lot more detail than is possible in a video. Stay tuned, and we'll see you next time for more on everything you need to know about the Catholic teaching on the Antichrist. For LifeSite News, this is John Henry Weston, and may God bless you. Hi everyone, this is John Henry Weston. We hope you enjoyed this program. To see more like it, be sure to hit the subscribe button below to get all the latest content from LifeSite News. Check the links in the description to read more and connect with us on social media so that you can stay up to date with all the latest life, family, faith, and freedom news. Thanks for watching, and may God bless you.